Well, we have a new uh, series that we're about to uh, start today. As you've heard, a four-part series. I, uh, in the time that I've been coming to uh, Dalwollinu, um, I don't think I've ever touched on the subject of marriage. And with everything in the news going on about uh, marriage relationships, whether it's the gay marriage debate or whatever else, domestic violence, um, I thought this is a good time uh, to spend a little bit of time on this subject of what does God have to say in his word um, about marriage. And as I uh, start the series this morning, I, I remembered a, a Facebook image and a message. You know, sometimes you get those images in Facebook, but they come with a Christian message or some sort of message typed over the top of them. And I remember this message, which had a picture of an elderly couple, I mean a very elderly couple, and they were sitting on a bench together. And uh, the message uh, was something along the lines of, uh, people ask us, how come we have been able to live together for so long? And then the answer they gave was, we come from an age when something was broken, you fixed it. Resonates, doesn't it? We come from an age when something was broken, you fixed it. It seems today we live in the throwaway age. If uh, something breaks, you throw it away and uh, you go and get something else. And unfortunately, that mentality and that, that habit of doing that has gone from things to relationships where it's just too easy to just walk away and seek a new partner or new friends and just forget about the old. And then when you um, consider marriage and the, the subject of marriage in society today, there's lots of bad news, isn't there? There's, there's lots of con controversy as well. As I mentioned a moment ago, you've, you've got the whole gay, day, uh, gay uh, marriage debate going on. And um, if you speak out against gay marriage, then of course, straight away, you're a bigot. Um, you know, we're, we're called upon to respect one point of view, but there's no respect for the alternate point of view, which is the Christian point of view. And two different standards go there in terms of the call for tolerance and, and for respect. Um, and then, of course, uh, you also hear of uh, marriage with regard to murder-suicides, where the relationship has, has gone so bad that um, the, the, you know, the parties are broken up and so often um, children are involved in these things as well. And usually the husband uh, takes his own life, but the life of the wife or the, or the life of the children together with him. And we've had a few of those only just again recently. And uh, it doesn't seem as though we have more than a month or so go by without one of these occurrences uh, and all the tragedy that goes with it. You also uh, hear about the problems of domestic violence violence in the home. It's, it's said that in Australia, the, the most dangerous place for a woman and the most dangerous place for children isn't the local park. It's the family home. Uh, one of the, the biggest problems in Australia is violence uh, in the home, again, often perpetrated by the husband, but not only the husband. Sometimes it's the wife who's the, the person who, who perpetrates the violence. But occasionally you do get some good news. Occasionally. And you don't get it in the, in the main news. <laughs> you often get it tacked at the end of the weather report. And then a special congratulation is given to a couple that celebrated a big anniversary, a 60th or a 65th wedding anniversary. Um, sometimes you might see it in the main news with a picture, but most often you'll hear it at the end of the weather report. Oh, by the way, congratulations to so-and-so in Bunbury or wherever else who have celebrated their 50th or 60th wedding anniversary. So what we want to do in, in this uh, series of sermons is take a look at what God has to say about how marriage was designed to work. You know, if you you really want something to work properly, go back to its design. See what was intended. Now, so often 
we blokes are accused of not looking at the manual until we can't work it out. And then we go to the manual. All right? Well, that's what's going on with regard to marriage in the world. People are trying it without the manual. And guess what? For most people, it's not working. And so what we want to do is go back to the manual. We want to see what the Bible has to say. We want to see what God has to say in terms of his intention for, for marriage. So as we uh, turn to our text uh, this morning, we want to uh, begin to see that the way that we, especially as Christians, are called to live in our marriages, in our relationships, um, is as new creations. That is, we are to live as those who aren't the same anymore as we used to be. And we're not the same as the rest of the world. We live from a different source of energy or power. We live from a different rule book. We do things not our way, but we seek to do things God's way. We live as those who have been transformed from within. And it's interesting, when you take a look at Matthew 19, you find it's one of those occasions where Jesus has been teaching and then he takes the disciples aside and uh, he says something to them privately. It's very interesting. When you go to Matthew 13, 10 to 11, you find another occasion like that. And what does it say there? The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. And so in our text this morning, we find Jesus is giving special instruction. And when we see this instruction, we see that it's meant especially for those with ears to hear. Jesus spoke in parables not to make things clear to people, but so those with the grace to hear would understand and would take it on board. You know, there's a lot of misunderstanding about Jesus' use of parables. A lot of people thought that he used parables to make things easier to understand. Jesus says exactly the opposite. I speak this way so those and only those with the grace to understand will get the message. And so as those who are new creations, those given the grace to understand, we approach this subject this morning and over the, uh, the next uh, few services we get together on this subject. So as we begin to deal with this subject, let's understand the Jewish position on marriage and divorce. Because that's what Jesus is dealing with in Matthew 19. There were two basic camps in Judaism. And remember, Judaism, you know, that was supposed to be the Jews, the people of God. Yet even within the camp of the people of God, there were two different views with regard to marriage and divorce. There was the view that said you could divorce for any reason. If your wife burnt your dinner, you could divorce her. If she got out of the wrong side of the bed and you didn't like her attitude, you could divorce her. You could divorce her for any reason. That was one, one understanding of the Jews. The other understanding was you could only divorce your wife on the ground of adultery. That is, the relationship was so severely broken on account of unfaithfulness that you could break the relationship. So those were the two opposing views. And so what you find is Jesus in this passage being put to the test. It actually says that they came to test him. They're really trying to, to trick him up. And in his answer, Jesus reveals that neither of those positions was really the right one. He revealed to the disciples that they were to approach it differently, and that means you and I as Christians today need to approach it differently. You know, the big question, even in churches, is what are the grounds for divorce? And Jesus says here that just asking the question that way already has put us on the wrong path. It makes separation and it makes divorce the subject matter. And Jesus says it ought not to be. In Matthew 19, 11, he points out that indeed what he's going to be talking about is such that only those with grace are going to be able to accept it. 
It says there, Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it's been given. Again, to listen to scripture, to hear what God has to say on this subject, to not start with the whole subject of divorce, but speak about what God wants. We can only do that from grace. You know, we had that song a little earlier, Open Up the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Unless the Lord opens up our heart to receive what he has to say, we're not going to be able to receive it. And so when we go to the subject and we see what the, the, the Jews had to say and we see what Jesus does in the answer, we see indeed that grace has to be at work if we're going to be able to accept uh, what God has to tell us this morning. What we have to understand with regard to Jesus' answer and, and Jesus being there to answer this question at that time was that God wants healing in relationships and he gives it, again, like any other healing, through Christ alone. You know, we're used in the Bible to hearing of Jesus laying his hand on someone and healing blindness, healing someone who was lame, even raising the dead. These are all manifestations of brokenness in life. What we have to get used to the fact too is those who have been redeemed, those who have been given a new power within through the Holy Spirit, those who are to see things differently, is that Jesus also came to heal broken relationships. So often we think of healing in terms of medical conditions. But Jesus also came to heal human misery with regard to broken relationships. In so many ways, we inflict misery on ourselves. And you see that in marriage relationships too. And the Lord's heart is broken, especially when he sees his own people in such misery. And so what he did on the cross wasn't just to heal those other things, but also to heal the misery of two people who just can't get along. And as we saw already this morning, the answer, the solution to that misery isn't to break up. That's not Jesus' solution. The solution is to fix it. And to fix it, there has to be grace at work in both partners. Not just one, but in both. So first of all, let's understand as we start this series, if we're going to understand it and if we're going to accept it, we have to do it as people who are changed in Christ. People who have the Holy Spirit working within. People who have the grace to hear and to understand what God has to say and who have the desire to put it into practice. One of the things that I always say to uh, people who, who I've counselled in the past with regard to marriage counselling, and there have been many cases in the uh, nearly 40 years of ministry now, is I can't help you. The only people that can help you are yourselves. The only people that can make a difference are yourselves. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you live out of God's grace. If you will not hear what God has to say, and if you will not seek his grace to live what you hear, then nobody can help you. And so that's what we have to understand as we go through this series. We have to stand as those who have been changed, those who've been transformed from within, those who know something different than the rest of the world, those for whom the answer is not divorce, but the answer is fix it. Fix it in the power and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's understand where the rot sets in. Because even within Christian relationships, churches have the problem. Seen it many times. Where people who come in and sit under the, the preaching of the word of God every Sunday, in, in the uh, tradition I come from, twice a Sunday, morning and evening, and you see the relationships still break up. Where does the rot set in? Well, when we uh, take a look at the, uh, the Jews, we, we get a little bit of, of an understanding. 
They're, they're looking for escape clauses. In Matthew 19, verse 3, we read, Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Like I said before, what was foremost on their mind was divorce, not marriage. What was foremost on their mind was the breakup of a relationship, not the fixing of a relationship. Jesus points out there, you've already started on the wrong track. The very question shows that those who are asking it, as the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, all right, it shows they had still not got God's teaching in Malachi, given hundreds of years before. In Malachi 2, 13 and 14, divorce was a problem. The issue at that time was men were, were exchanging older wives for younger models. You've seen some of that in, in Australian life over the past decades. I won't name them, but I can remember at least two very prominent people. Once they reached their years of success, assisted by their wives and supported by them, once they got to that pinnacle of fame and success, they ditched their wives and took on younger women to be their wives. That's exactly the situation addressed in Malachi. Listen to what it says. Another thing you do, it's talking to males who are Jews. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask, why? So there it is. These Jews are coming to church, as it were. They're still worshipping. They're still presenting their offerings to God, and God isn't listening. And they get the message, God's not listening. And they're flooding the altar with tears. They're crying in despair because God's not accepting their offerings. And they ask, why not? And then the answer comes back. Listen to it. It is because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth. Because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. You ask why, says the Lord? It's because that young wife that you married when you were young, you broke faith with her. You have broken the covenant you made with her before me, and I was the witness to your marriage. And you think I'm going to stand by and just let that happen? And it goes on in that passage. I encourage you to read it. Tells them to mend their ways, to change their ways, and to not despise the wife of their youth. Now, these Pharisees came with a question of divorce. And what Jesus knows is that God grieves when his people have broken relationships like that. And especially when in the Jewish system, the women were being treated that way. God grieved for his daughters. You know, you get that you know, comedy line with regard to a young guy wanting to take uh, a fella's daughter out. And he's got the shotgun, shotgun ready, you know, scare him off. When it comes time for the proposal, he says, now you look after my daughter, and if you don't, I'm coming after you. We all heard, heard it, you know it. Essentially, that's what God is saying in Malachi. I stand opposed to you because you have not treated my daughter right. And until you do... I won't accept your sacrifices and you can keep flooding my altar with tears. I'm not going to change my heart towards you until you treat my daughter right. The Pharisees wanted to talk about divorce. Jesus was only interested in healing relationships. In Matthew 19 verse 8, Jesus pointed to the heart of the problem when it came to divorce. You know, they asked, well, if divorce is wrong, then why did Moses permit it? 
pitting Moses over against Jesus here, thinking that Moses was greater than Jesus. If divorce is wrong, they got the message from Jesus, if divorce is wrong, then why did Moses permit it? Listen to Jesus' reply. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. In other words, this isn't God's will. This isn't what God wants in terms of what you do when a a relationship breaks down. Moses was permitted by God to make this allowance, but only because of your hardness, only because of your stiff-neckedness, only because of your sinfulness. Not because this is what God wants. I wonder if we've ever thought about it that way. That when Christian marriages especially break down and people often run for the divorce courts, that they don't understand the way that they're dealing with it reveals one thing. Hardness of heart. It's not revealing a life lived out of grace. Did you know that even with regard to adultery, you know, there were those two views, you can divorce her for any reason or you divorce only for adultery. Even with regard to adultery, the Lord had to say something about the restoration of a relationship. Do you remember the prophet Hosea? Hosea was a prophet that God used in order to teach a special lesson to Israel. He was commanded by God to go and marry a prostitute. Can you imagine that? He was commanded to marry a prostitute. And guess what? When he married her, she was unfaithful to him. What did God say? Did God say, oh, because of unfaithfulness, marital unfaithfulness, you can now divorce her? No. In Hosea 3, 1, we read, The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Now listen to this. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. God often called the Israelites adulterers. Israel was his bride. She often went and worshipped idols. And God says in other places of scripture that she was a whore. And what does God say to Hosea? You married a prostitute. She's been unfaithful to you. This is what you're going to do. You're going to teach Israel something about my love. And this is how we're going to do it, Hosea. You're going to take her back again. And you will love her as the Lord loves Israel in spite of her adulteries. Even for that, the Lord prefers fix it. Because that's what God did for us in Jesus, didn't he? When we're unfaithful, we are like adulterers. What has God done as to our relationship with him? He's fixed it. You know, one of the most compelling things I learned about marriage, I learned as a teenager in the church I was brought up in, back in in the northern beaches of Sydney, where I came from. There was an elder there who um, was often the the guy who came and did the pastoral visits. In, In the system I come from, it's not only the pastor who came and did pastoral visits, but the elders worked in teams of two, and once a year they visited people on their list. They each had a list of people they had to visit every year. And these elders would come and they would read scripture with the whole family. And they would then go through that scripture and talk about it and, and you know, get your views on it. And it'd be like a, a mini Bible study, but they would ask very penetrating questions in terms of where you stood in your faith and your relationship with the Lord. And this was one of those elders, as a, as a teenager, I really regarded highly. If, if there was a, a man of God uh, that I understood to be a man of God, this was one of them. And after I, I had left that church and gone to college, I heard that this man 
went off with a woman, a younger woman, who came to the church from another denomination and joined the church. And together they took off, to, you know, with one another and began to live with one another. Now, by that time, he would have already been in, in about his 60s, I imagine. And then they had a child together. Now, my esteem for that fellow just went rock bottom. And I don't know how his wife was handling things, but I reckon she would have been a mess. They must have been married for many, many years already. But one of the greatest lessons I had about marriage was that he contracted cancer and the Lord caused him to wake up to himself and he came back to his wife and asked to be taken back. And you know what she did? She took him back. And he got sick pretty quickly to the point that she became his carer to the day he died. It was that view of marriage that she had that spoke volumes to me and made, made Malachi really come to life. In spite of the adultery, in spite of fathering a child with this other woman, she took him back because she understood what marriage was and what living out of grace meant. And that's what Jesus meant when he said to the Jews, Moses permitted this, not because it's right, but because of limiting evil, as it were, putting a break on it. He did this because of the hardness of your heart. And so when people want to talk about a marriage breaking up, especially Christian marriage, and seeing divorce as a God-sanctioned way. Fine, says Jesus, but let's understand this. When that is your recourse, let's understand it's because of the hardness of heart and not living out of grace. Because I in Christ have shown you a different way. I in Christ have demonstrated to you a different way, a better way. So as we go through this series, we want to see marriage as it's redeemed in Jesus. How it should work. You know, some say as a joke, you get 15 years for murder, but life for marriage. You heard that one? <laughs> Straight away. We see there an attitude that says, marriage is the pits. And if it doesn't work, you get out of it. But that's not what you find in Scripture. You know, Jesus made it quite clear. From the beginning, it was not this way in terms of breakups and divorces and everything else. How was it at the beginning? Jesus throws us, uh, uh, throws us back to the beginning in Matthew 19. From the beginning, it was not this way. Well, how was it? What was the way in the beginning? Well, Genesis 2, 18, 23. The Lord said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Commentators, and I think they're quite right, uh, say that Adam's song there, because that's what it is, it's a song. This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. It's the first wolf whistle. Adam has been looking at all these animals that he's been naming and something's missing. And the Lord makes it quite clear what's missing is a helper suitable to him. Someone who will be his perfect complement. Something's missing. And when Adam sees Eve for the first time, he says, yes, <laughs> this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He celebrates he sees his equal and he sees his partner, his complementary partner. I couldn't help but when I was going over this sermon again yesterday, uh, an old song came to mind. I'm going to show my age again. I wonder how many of you remember the song A Hundred Pounds of Clay by Gene McDaniels. It was number three in the USA in the 60s. It's a song that is built on this passage of scripture in Genesis with regard to something missing and God providing it. I'll uh, bore you with a few of the words. 
He took a hundred pounds of clay and then he said, hey, listen, I'm going to fix this world today because I know what's missing. Then, he's ro then he rolled his big sleeves up and a brand new world began. He created a woman and lots of loving for a man. Do you see there as marriage seen as a prison, as a sentence? In the text in Genesis, and also already in that first verse of this song, it's something celebrated. This is fantastic what God has created and designed. goes on a bit further. With just a hundred pounds of clay, he made my life worth living. And I'll thank him every day for every kiss you're given. And I shall thank him every night for the arms that are holding me tight. And he did it all with just a hundred pounds of clay. That attitude towards marriage is what is so much missing in today's world. An old song, probably from a, a non-Christian, who knows? But it gets the attitude of Genesis 1 right. Or Genesis 2. The Lord created something beautiful, something outstanding, Something that makes life just that much more worth living when he created that relationship between man and woman. And divorce was furthest from his mind. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. Marriage isn't a prison sentence, but God's precious gift to humanity to be celebrated. What we'll see, Lord willing, in the series ahead is that it only works. Marriage will be the blessing and the, the, the thing to celebrate only if both in the relationship seek to be channels of grace to each other. You know that old song from Francis of Assisi? Make me a channel of your peace. Well, maybe in the next, one of the next services we'll sing that. Make me a channel of your peace. The whole song is basically a prayer saying, Lord, help me not to make it about me, but help me to be a channel of your peace and of your grace to others. And the Lord says, that's how marriage is supposed to work. It's not about my rights. It's not about my expectations. It's not about my wants, what I'm going to get out of the relationship. It's about how I can be a channel of God's grace and peace to my partner every day, in every way. If marriage isn't lived that way, it won't work. A gift God's given a gift which, when lived the right way, actually imitates the relationship Jesus has with the church. Did you know that? A Christian marriage is supposed to present a picture of the relationship Jesus has with his church. It's supposed to be its own form of witness to the world. Let me just finish with what one commentator said There'll be no occasion for divorces if we forbear with one another and forgive one another in love as those that are, that are and hope to be forgiven and have found that God has not put us away. Beautiful, isn't it? I'll say that again. There'll be no occasion for divorces if we forbear with one another, forgive one another in love and those that are and hope to be forgiven and have found that God has not put us away. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we give you thanks that you love us so much that when a relationship breaks down and when one in that relationship treats the other the wrong way, you are incensed in the way that your son or daughter has been mistreated. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful creation 
of the relationship between a man and a woman. We thank you, Father, for that note of celebration we find in Adam's reply in Genesis 2 when he sees Eve for the first time. We thank you, Lord, for that wonderful relationship that uh, is there between Jesus and the church, which is connected to that, that whole imagery of, of a bride and the bridegroom. And Lord, we, we praise you that you have loved us so much that when we have become adulterers, you have not put us away, but you have sought to fix the relationship and have done so at great cost to yourself through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Teach us this grace. Teach us this sacrificial love. And as we go on in this relationship, help us to listen to what you have to say about marriage and how it can work even in a broken world so affected by sin. Help us to live with one another in, in such a way, Lord, that we live out of that grace, bearing testimony to your great love. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.